Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to go through a practice problem which is all about price floors. Now in the question I will be working with algebraic functions, but I do have another video where I go through a practice question on price floors where I just work with diagrams so no algebra. I'll link to that video up here and also in the description if that's what you are after. In this question, we are told that market demand is described by the equation QD is equal to 1800 minus 3P and market supply is described by the equation QS is equal to 2P. Let's start thinking about part A. A price floor of $400 is imposed on the market. Is it a binding or non-binding floor? Is there a glut or a shortage? Illustrate your findings on a diagram. Now, whether a price floor is binding or not will depend on where it sits in relation to the equilibrium point in the market. So let's start with step one, finding the equilibrium point and also drawing everything out. Equilibrium is defined where a quantity demanded, that's QD, is equal to quantity supplied, that's QS. We have both of those functions in our question, so we can just substitute those in. So we get quantity demanded is 1,800 minus 3P is equal to our supply, quantity supplied is 2P. I can add 3P to both sides and I get 1,800 is equal to, well, 5P. Then we can divide both sides by five. We get 1,800 over five, which is 360. That's equal to our equilibrium price, P star, that's 360. I can then substitute that price of 360 into either my demand or supply function. It doesn't matter which, they're equal at this price. I'm going to use the supply function because it's easiest. So our equilibrium quantity, that's Q star, is equal to the quantity supplied evaluated at P star. So that is equal to, well, quantity supplied is equal to two times P and our P will be our P star, which is 360. So two times 360 is 720. This is a good time to start to draw all of this out. So I'm going to just draw two axes. We have our horizontal axes, which tracks our quantity and our vertical axes will track the price. I'll start by drawing our demand curve. It's the easiest to draw because it has a price axis intercept and a quantity axis intercept. So I'm just going to find those two points and then join those points together. We can start by finding the price axis intercept by setting quantity demanded, that's QD equal to zero. So using our demand function, QD will be zero. So zero is equal to 1,800 minus 3P. If we add 3P to both sides, we get 3P is equal to 1,800. Dividing both sides by three, we get P is equal to 600. So that's our price axis intercept and I can put that point on our axis. I can find the quantity axis intercept by setting P is equal to zero. So I get, again, just using our demand function, QD is equal to 1,800 minus three times zero. That's equal to 1,800. And I can put that point on our axis as well. So I have two points, that's excellent. I'm going to join them together and that's the shape of our demand curve. Now we can think about our supply function. And actually I can tell immediately that our supply function will come through the origin. I can tell this because if you look at the function, when the price is equal to zero, our quantity supplied is equal to two times zero, which is equal to zero. So this tells me that our supply line goes through the origin where price and quantity are both equal to zero. To figure out the shape of the curve beyond this point, I could find the slope or another point. However, I also know that at the point where the supply curve, where that intercepts our demand curve, the price will be equal to 360 and the quantity will be equal to 720. That's our equilibrium points that we found before. Essentially then I can anchor the shape of my supply curve to the equilibrium point then. And so maybe it would look something like this. Now our second step then is to impose the price floor on this market. So our price floor of 400 actually lies above our market equilibrium price, which is 360. So maybe something like this. Now the price floor will prevent the price in this market from going below 400. And in general, a binding price floor is one that makes a difference to the market. It binds the market to an outcome it would not otherwise reach, i.e. to a non-equilibrium outcome. 
A non-binding price floor, on the other hand, makes no difference to the market outcome. It does not bind the market to the floor or to, to a particular price. And in this case, the market outcome will be equal to the equilibrium. Now, price floors that lie above the equilibrium price will be binding. So here I can tell because our price floor is above the equilibrium price, so 400 is greater than 360, I do know that this is a binding price floor. To quickly just explain why, let's evaluate what's happening in the market at that price floor of 400. So we'll evaluate how much is demanded and how much is supplied at that price. And if you see where, for instance, the price line of 400 hits our demand and we draw a line down, that quantity will be how much that is demanded at that price. Using our demand equation, we can find that amount. It will be QD is equal to 1,800 minus three times, well, the price will be 400. So that's 1,800 minus 1,200, which is 600. We can do the same thing with our supply. So seeing where that price line of 400 hits our supply curve and drawing a line down, that quantity will be how much is supplied at the price of 400. And using our supply function, we see that, that well, QS is equal to two times the price will be 400, so 800. And actually we can see here that the amount supplied, which is 800, is greater than the amount demanded, which is 600. So we have an excess supply in this market or a glut we can find out by how much just by taking the difference between how much is supplied and how much is demanded. So 800 minus 600 is 200. So we can see at this price floor, the market experiences a glut. There's too much stock. The price is too high. Now, if the price floor wasn't there, the way that our market would get rid of this glut is through a lowering of the prices through the price mechanism. The suppliers would see that there was excess stock on their shelves and they would want to get rid of that stock and in order to do that they would lower the price to attract more consumers. Visually this is shown as a movement along our supply curve, a leftward movement. As the price decreases, the quantity supplied decreases along with the price. And the quantity demanded will increase in response to the decrease in price. So there's a movement to the right along the demand curve quantity demanded will increase, more consumers are willing to buy the product at this lower price. So as the price decreases, the size of the glut will get smaller and smaller as the quantity demanded increases and the quantity supply decreases until we get to our equilibrium point where quantity demanded is exactly equal to quantity supplied. At this point, there's no more glut and there's no reason for our suppliers to change the price. When there is a price floor though, however, the price of 400 is the lowest price that the market can ever get to. So the mechanism by which the price gets to the market equilibrium is stifled. So the market is bound to that price floor price, which is not the equilibrium price. So we have a binding price floor. All right, so that's part A. Let's move on to part B. I'll clear the screen and put up part B here. In part B, we are asked to calculate consumer surplus, producer surplus, total surplus and deadweight loss, both before and after the price floor is imposed. And we're also asked to evaluate who benefits, if anyone, from the imposition of the price floor. I have copied the diagram here. So the diagram on the left will be the evaluation of our surplus without the price floor and the diagram on the right can be with the price floor. Let's start with the market without the price floor and we can start with consumer surplus. Now in this market with no price floor, the market price is 360 and 720 units will be traded. So consumer surplus will be the area below the demand curve above the price over the units consumed. That's this green area here. So consumer surplus CS, that area will be half times base times height which is equal to half times the base here will be 720. This height here will be the difference between the intercept 600 and the price 360. That difference is 240. So once I do all those sums, you can check if you want, uh, but that's equal to 86,400. Now producer surplus, that's PS, is the area above the supply curve under the price over all of the units supplied. Now in this market, the price is 360 and 720 units will be supplied. So we get this area here as producer surplus. The area of our triangle is again, just half times base times height, 
which is equal to half times our base will be again 720 and our height will be this height here which is 360. So that's all equal to 129,600. The total surplus in this market will be the sum of our consumer surplus plus our producer surplus. So 86,400 plus 129,600 and that's equal to 216,000. Now there is no dead weight loss in this market, at least as far as we know. We haven't been told about any externalities or anything like that. So that's our welfare before the price floor is imposed. Let's look at what happens when we introduce the price floor. As we saw in part A, at this price of 400, the quantity supplied is 800, but we just don't have the demand for this amount. Our consumers will only buy 600 units. So 600 units will be traded. And that means the area of our consumer surplus will be here, the green area. Again, just under the demand curve over those units consumed we can use our formula half times base times height. In this case, our base is well, 600. And the height will be this height here, the difference between the intercept 600 and the price 400, so 200. And half times 600 times 200 is equal to 60,000. Now our producer surplus is equal to actually this area here. This is the area above our supply curve under the price over those units traded. Now here you might have some questions, so I'll just explain quickly. One interpretation of our supply curve is as tracking our willingness to sell, which is WTS. Now our willingness to sell is like the reservation price for our suppliers. It's the minimum price that a supplier needs in order to be incentivized to supply a particular marginal unit. And producer surplus is found by taking the difference between the price and the willingness to sell for each unit produced and traded. And this difference is good for the producer because it means that when that good is traded, the producer gets more than the minimum that they require. So that's why the area below the price above the supply curve is equal to producer surplus because that area essentially sums up the difference between the price and the willingness to sell, that's our supply curve, for all units traded. By taking this area in red, however, we are implicitly assuming that it is the first 600 units that are in illustrated on our diagram that are actually being traded. Because as we know, as we saw before, there is a glut in this market. A full 800 units are being supplied. And all the way up, I can hope you can see, I'm just tracing up the, the supply curve, all of these units are being supplied. And who knows exactly which one of these units are being actually traded. If any of the units on the upper part of the supply curve are being traded instead of exactly the first 600, our producer surplus would be different because the willingness to sell for those units are different. So there is this assumption here underlying this designation of this space as producer surplus that it's really these first 600 units that are actually being traded. In any case, once we do that, the area of this producer surplus is a trapezium. And I always forget the formula for the area of a trapezium. So I always just divide it up into a rectangle and a triangle. So I've outlined it in like a yellow dashed. I hope you can see. The area of the rectangle is base times height. Now the base will be this length here, which is 600, and the height is this length here. And I hope you can see, or I hope you can tell, that we need to find a height here, this height here, this level, which is found by evaluating the supply function when the quantity is equal to 600. So QS is equal to two times P, and QS is 600. So 600 is equal to two P, Dividing both sides by two, we find that P is equal to 300. So this is this height here. So the height of our rectangle then is 400 minus 300, which is 100. And we add to that area, the area of a triangle, which is half times the base of the triangle, which is 600 times the height, which we just found, which is 300. 100 times 600 is equal to 60,000. And half times 600 times 300 is 90,000. So I get 150,000 all up for our producer surplus. And I'm sorry, that's really squashy. I hope you can see it. 
Now our total surplus here is consumer surplus plus producer surplus. So equal to 60,000 plus 150,000, which is 210,000. The next thing we should find is deadweight loss, which will be actually equal to this triangle here, the purple triangle. Again, the area is half times base times height. So half times, we can make this the base, which we said was 100. That was the difference between 400 and 300. And the height then would be this length here, which will be the difference between 720 and 600. So 120, half times 100 times 120 is 6,000. Now we can check our calculations here. The deadweight loss can be interpreted as the loss of total surplus as we move away from the efficient equilibrium where demand is equal to supply. So before the price floor, our total surplus was 216,000 and after it's 210,000, the difference is 6,000, which is what we found for our deadweight loss. So we're, we're verifying our calculations. Now, in terms of who benefits, intuitively, the price has risen in this market due to the price floor. So if it's going to be anyone, we would think it would be the producer who benefits from this. And we see here that indeed the producers do benefit and the consumers definitely do not. Consumer surplus has decreased from 86,400 to 60,000. So our consumers are doing worse. Producer surplus has increased from 129,600 to 150,000. So the producers are doing better. All right, so that's the question. I hope that this all makes sense. Thank you so much for watching my video. I do hope that it helped. Please like and subscribe and keep well.